Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Good evening and welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Lepak Shikurana. Here are the top stories we're tracking for you on Friday, the 20th of May. Flood situation in India's northeastern Assam remains grim. Rescue operations underway. Activists demand UN to declare Balochistan a war zone over rights violations by Pakistan. And Sri Lanka appoints nine new cabinet members amid crisis. And now for all the details, the flood situation remained grim in India's northeastern Assam state on Friday with nearly 700,000 people affected in 27 districts by the deluge triggered by pre-monsoon rains. Disaster management officials were seen rescuing people to higher grounds and providing relief material. Nearly 700,000 people were affected as flood situation worsened across India's northeastern Assam state with disaster management personnel conducting rescue operations on a war footing on Friday. One of the world's largest rivers, the Brahmaputra, which flows through India and neighbouring Bangladesh, has burst its banks in Assam over the past one week, inundating more than 1,500 villages. At least nine people have reportedly died in natural calamity so far. The situation remained extremely grave in the worst hit Dima Hasaud district, with both rail and road links snapped. A flood-like situation was also witnessed in southern Kerala state on Friday as incessant rainfall led to water logging in several areas. The weather office has issued an orange alert for the next 48 hours in 12 districts of Kerala. Meanwhile, at least one construction worker was killed and nine others were feared trapped on Friday after part of an under-construction tunnel collapsed in Ramban town in northern Jammu and Kashmir territory. Rescue work was in progress till the last reports came in. However, shooting stones made it difficult for the rescue personnel to carry out operations in the region, notorious for frequent landslides. And in news from Pakistan, Pakistan's new foreign minister, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, during his U.S. visit on Thursday, said he would seek to pivot away from single-issue transactional relationship with the United States. His remarks came as Islamabad seeks to repair ties with Washington Fred due to ousted Premier Imran Khan's harsh anti-U.S. rhetoric. He, however, defended Khan's trip to Moscow on the day Russia invaded Ukraine. Pakistan's new foreign minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari said on Thursday he would like to pivot away from single-use transactional relationship with the United States as he sought to repair ties with Washington frayed recently due to ousted Premier Imran Khan's anti-US rhetoric. Addressing reporters during his first US visit since assuming office three weeks ago, Bilawal, however, defended Imran Khan's Moscow visit, saying there was no way for him to know that Russia would invade Ukraine on the day he landed in the Russian capital, a move for which the former Prime Minister has faced backlash. He said Islamabad does not wish to be part of any conflict and seeks a more broad-based relationship with the US with a particular emphasis on trade. Our uh, relationship with the United States um, has been coloured too much by the geopolitical conflicts uh, in our region and particularly uh, by the events uh, and circumstances in Afghanistan. We seek to have a, mo have a more broad base uh, relationship that encompasses uh, all the uh, dynamics of our friendship, which would have uh, obviously a political com component, a people-to-people -people component, the defense component, but most importantly, the economic component. Earlier on Wednesday, Bilawal also told U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken that Pakistan prefers trade over aid. Former PM Imran Khan had antagonized the U.S. throughout his tenure welcoming the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan last year, 
and more recently accusing Washington of being behind the attempt to oust him. The U.S. has dismissed the accusation. And more on news from Pakistan. Pakistan has imposed a ban on the import of non-essential and luxury items as the cash-strapped nation tries to avert a financial crisis amid depleting foreign reserves. Information Minister Mariam Aurangzeb on Thursday termed the ongoing economic crisis an emergency situation. Pakistan's federal cabinet on Thursday banned over 30 non-essential luxurious items, including cars and fruit jam, in an austerity move to help in boosting the country's faltering economy. Newly elected Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif said that the decision will save the country's precious foreign exchange as he blamed the previous PTI government for the economic burden. This comes as reports suggested Pakistan has agreed to accept most of the demands laid out by the IMF, International Monetary Fund, including cutting down subsidies on oil and power as officials are holding talks until May 23 for resumption of stalled six billion US dollars loan program. Meanwhile, Information Minister Mariam Aurangzeb termed the financial crisis as an emergency situation and said Pakistanis will have to make sacrifices under a new economic plan. And this time, Pakistanis will have to give a economic plan under a new economic plan. And these are all the things that will be impacted for two months, which will impact the foreign reserve exchange. And for the year, all these things will be banned for the year, for the year, जो इसका इम्पैक्ट है दीगर इकतमात करने के बाद वो छः बिलियन डॉलर सालाना इम्पैक्ट होता है। The Pakistani rupee weakened to about 198.39 to the dollar on Wednesday amid surging inflation, while foreign reserves have fallen to as low as 10.3 billion US dollars. Pakistan badly needs the resumption of the IMF loan program, and if everything goes well, then Pakistan will receive more than $900 million, which will help unlock other external financing. While moving on, scores of Baloch activists held an anti-Pakistan protest in London this week over the issue of enforced disappearances and other rights violations in Balochistan province by the Pakistani security forces. The protesters gathered outside the British Prime Minister's residence and raised slogans against what they termed illegal arrest of Noorjan, a resident of Hoshang area for allegedly having links with Baloch insurgents. They blamed that Baloch people have been targets of so-called military operations, ethnic stereotyping and abductions by the Pakistani state, while it exploits their natural resources. The protesters demanded the immediate withdrawal of the occupying forces from the region. And in news from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka appointed nine new cabinet members on Friday, among them ministers for the critical portfolios of health, trade and tourism as the island nation battles its worst economic crisis in history. Tourism dependent Sri Lanka is facing a dire shortage of foreign exchange, fuel and medicines and economic activity has slowed to a crawl. Nine cabinet ministers of the new old party government took their oaths before Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajpaksa in Colombo on Friday. Ministers for the critical portfolios of health, trade and tourism were appointed as the island nation battles its worst economic crisis in history. Four ministers were sworn in last week. Veteran politician Ranil Vikramasinghe took over as Prime Minister this month to form a new cabinet after the President's elder brother Mahinda Rajpaksa resigned from the job. Soon after, Sri Lanka's stock market climbed over 1% and clocked a second consecutive weekly gain boosted by heavyweight industrial and financial stocks. However, locals bemoaned vows aggravated by a food shortage. PM Vikramasinghe has warned of a food shortage and what the government will buy enough fertilizer for the next planting season to boost harvests. So without gas, we can't do anything. Without carcinol, we can't do anything. So last thing, we have to go to the dye. The next month, you can see Sri Lankan people without food, lot of people died. A long queue had formed in front of a shop selling cooking gas cylinders, the price of which have soared to nearly 5,000 rupees, that is 14 US dollars, from 2,675 rupees in April. On Thursday, Sri Lankan police fired tear gas and water cannon to push back student protesters who marched through the streets of Colombo demanding the arrest and removal of President Gotabaya Rajpaksa. 
The island nation's economic crisis has come from the confluence of the COVID-19 pandemic battering the tourism-reliant economy, rising oil prices and populist tax cuts by the government of President Gotabaya and his brother Mahinda. And moving on to news from Nepal, people from different walks on Friday held a protest outside Prime Minister's house in Kathmandu, demanding justice for a rape victim who made public her ordeal that took place eight years ago through social media platform. The protesters demanded an end to the statute of limitations on cases of rape and other sexual offences and setting up fast-track courts to look into the cases. People from different walks of life, including women activists, on Friday staged a demonstration outside Nepal Prime Minister's residence in Kathmandu, demanding justice for a victim who spoke out regarding her sexual abuse in a beauty pageant eight years ago. The protest was organized after the victim on TikTok, a video sharing app, on Wednesday narrated the incident that she was raped by the organizers of Miss Global International following her participation at the event in 2014. Her video then went viral, sparking a new round of debate around rape laws in Nepal. The protesters chanted slogans demanding the removal of the statute of limitations for rape and other sexual offences cases which states that rape cases can only be filed within one year of the date of the incident. In laws of our country in terms of rape especially, they are not supportive of survivors or victims. First and foremost, the most important one is, has to do with the statute of limitation. That is only for one year. And you cannot expect for a survivor to just come out and say and reveal what they have gone through within a year of time span. You cannot define and limit the trauma and the time that they had, trauma that they face and limit it into a time frame. So that has to be the major one. The protesters also demanded setting up fast-track courts to look into the cases of rape and sexual violence among others. Meanwhile, the police has begun investigation onto the matter. And in news from Afghanistan, Afghanistan is one of the most heavily mine-affected countries of the world. The Omar Mine Museum in Afghan capital Kabul showcases the peril of war in the country. It also acts as a training and education center for land mine and unexploded ordnance clearance. The Omar Mine Museum in the Afghan capital Kabul displays a variety of landmines and explosive remnants of war highlighting the danger of the hidden enemies. Run by the Organization for Mine Clearance and Afghan Rehabilitation, Omar, it acts as a training and education center for mine clearance. The museum contains a collection of 51 types of landmines out of the 53 types that have been used in Afghanistan during the decades of wars and fighting. Afghanistan is one of the most heavily mine affected countries of the world. According to the United Nations, since 1988, more than 41,000 Afghan civilians have been killed or injured by landmines. Landmines have continued to kill or maim more than 120 people every month in Afghanistan, one of the most landmine contaminated countries, the State Ministry for Disaster, Management and Humanitarian Affairs said in April. According to the ministry, it would take seven to eight years to rid the Asian country of the menace of mines. Well, India's telecom minister Ashwini Vaishnav on Thursday made the first 5G audio and video call on a trial network set up at Public Technical University IIT Madras using indigenously developed technology. The minister said the entire end-to-end -end network is designed and developed in India. He visited India's first 5G testbed on Thursday, which was inaugurated by Prime Minister Narendra Modi earlier this week, and will enable and startups and industry players to test their products locally. The Department of Telecommunications earlier confirmed that 5G services will launch in India in 2022. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We'll see you same time next week. Have a great weekend. Good night.